if you look through lesson one, you're going to see a bunch of figures. In fact, that's pretty much all there is on here. Keep in mind what you're going to see in here are different types of maps. Now, the thing you want to keep, uh, keep in mind with maps is two things. One, this is probably going to be the basis or the start of any design you do, is you're going to start it from an existing map. If you're going to do that type of work, the thing you then need to know, if I'm using a map to start my design or to get initial concepts and information, you have to know what's on these maps so that you're not spending your time looking at a map that isn't intended to give you the information that you have. So I'm going to kind of hit the broad areas as we go through here and what you can really expect on them and how they're, how they're laid out. We'll start with this first one right here, a geographic map. When we talk about a geographic map, what we're talking about here is the spatial constraints of typically man-made objects to each other. There is natural phenomenon or geology on them, but it is not really meant for it. It's only meant for it as a reference. It's how you locate things. How do you locate something in relationship to something else? That's what this map is meant for. As you look at the examples here, let me kind of zoom in on this. I know these, these prints aren't the best, but certainly you can Google this same thing and find it boatloads of examples. Primarily, let's start with how we're displaying natural phenomenon or the contours of the earth here. Notice they just got one statement through here. Mountains. <laughs> Do you see any mountains? Do you see any peaks? No, and you won't unless there is some that are very noticeable. Okay. An example, if I'm looking at a place of Portland, and I'm looking at a geographic map, Portland, Oregon, I would expect to see a little cross that says Mount Hood because it's the only mountain in the whole area. It's very descriptive, and you can orient yourself geographically by that landmark. So that's one I would see. If I've got a whole mountain range, don't expect to see individual peaks on here. If you've got the Snake River Canyon, expect it to be just a note on there, Canyon, a Snake River whatever the case might be. Remember, this is referencing. And it's mostly man-made stuff. So what you're going to see on here is towns. So we have little towns in here. These are circles. We notice we use different symbols for different towns. There will probably be a legend that goes with this that will define that out, where an open circle might be a town of 10,000 population or less. The circle of the same size that's filled in might be 25,000. And then they might use a bigger symbol for a larger town, and so on. You'll see highways and major roads. You won't see county roads. You'll see stuff that roads that are generally handled by large municipalities. You'll see property boundaries. Now, when I say property boundaries, we are going to be talking, for the most part, on this scale, state or government boundaries. So you might see the United States boundary versus Mexico or Canada. You might see Idaho versus Washington. If you come in closer, the boundaries you see will turn to private boundaries, private land ownership. So a lot of that will depend on the scale of the drawing also. This is a real close example of an old road map that we used to buy at gas stations. Those of us older than 30 remember those days. And now you all just type it into your phone, and believe it or not, guess what? You're using a geographic map every single time you tie into that phone and say, go to this location. It's accessing a large-scale map. So geographic maps, typically fairly large in scale, used to locate entities to each other. The next map, and we're going to get into this one later. I thought about pulling these out. This type of map here is really where most of our design starts from, a topographical map. 
Now, a topographical map is a geographic map. So it has things in an XY relationship to each other. But now we interject lines to estimate, and I want to emphasize that word, estimate the Z dimension on the drawing so that we can get an idea of the contour of the land. These are really, we're, we've reduced the scale on this compar compared to most geographic maps because we can't really do topo lines, these things here, on a large scale. So this is the same thing as the map you saw before, but now the Z dimension has been added to it. So it's got X, Y, and Z. It still will have all of our major roads, boundaries. This one's such a scale you're actually seeing section lines for surveying, um, land ownership, all of that will be still specced out on these. We've got literally a hundred of these in the flat file back here labeled maps. Now we have a whole section on topos because this topo maps are really our beginning design of choice. So we've got a whole section of it that will come up in three, four days where we will look at these in great detail so you know how to read them, you know how to draw them, whole nine yards. So for now, know that a topographical map is a geographic map that has the Z dimension added to it. What is yes. That one? The, just the dots. The dots that are through here. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure what these are. They could be a variety of things. They could be a well hole. We could be looking at an area that's got a lot of oil exploration or mining exploration, and they put um, well casings on them. They could be. Um, they could be towns. I yeah. doubt it on this. Well, there, there's always a legend that goes with these maps. Keep in mind, maps, all of them, will have scale, legends. The one thing they will also have is a magnet, magnetic deviation. Because when we look at a map, any map, it is always laid out the same to where towards the top we have north, we have east to the right, west to the left, and south coming down. Now we have to correlate this to being on the ground. True north is not definable by us in the field. Because we use a compass, right? To define true north. And that moves around up in, I think it's a Bering Sea. And so we have a magnetic declination, so when we set a compass up and it points to north, it will be some angle off of true north. We can measure that and then we make the adjustment. And to find out what it is right now, it's pretty easy to find. Just on Google type in magnetic declination and let's see if we can find out what it is today. You need to check this fairly regularly because it moves fairly quickly. So I'm just going to pop open and let's see if we can't find out what it is right now. Magnetic declination. And you want to look for, I'm going to kind of throw back to the computer here. Look for this noaa.gov website. It's actually a Navy site and they they monitor this, monitor this. And so I got my first link on here, declination calculate. I'm going to click into that. And it's going to ask me where I'm at and all that jazz. So um, you can type in your location over on the right if you do not know your Latin long. So I'm going to type in Twin Falls, Idaho. up there and it's pointing to north, 
I need to turn 12, where was I? About 12 and a half degrees to the east. That's where it really is true north. So do you do this when you're doing a, a plan? Do you, do you find out, do you put in the location of what you're designing to get your true north? No, this mostly affects us when we are in the field. Because we'll just lay it out as true north. But then when a surveyor or somebody goes out to the field to try and get it, then they have to make that adjustment. Okay. Of where it's at. Yes? This might be a dumb question, but what about the compass that's on your phone because it's not actually using like magnets or nothing? Is it using like... I'm not 100% sure because I don't have one on my phone and I don't use it. Um, I know I do have to. I have a GPS unit I carry and I have to update the declination on it, and then it makes the adjustment for me. And once a year, I hit a little site on it, and it goes and reads what it is, and then makes that adjustment for me. But I think it's used in a combination of both. I, I'm not really sure. You'd have to look into your phone and see. And it probably wouldn't take you very long to find that answer. If you do find that answer, okay, maybe if you can share it with the class. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next map. The first two I should take in to account, and also this one, they do not do a geodetic survey on these. Geodetic. Now, what is a geodetic survey? Did anybody find that? It's actually in your um, stuff. What is a geodetic survey? Yeah, go ahead. So surveying the Earth's surface, making allowance for its curvature, and giving an accurate framework for the small scale surveys. Okay, so it's a survey, a measurement on the Earth that takes into account the curvature of the Earth. So it's the most accurate we have. All the maps we've looked at today do not have geodetic surveys. In fact, probably 90% of them do not. They are flat maps. They assume that everything they look at is flat. Okay? So now, I'm looking at a cadastral map. When you measure, notice that on this map, this is a geographic map that is brought into a smaller scale. We think of this mostly as subdivision maps. Okay? This does not have geodetics on it. So it has not taken the fact of the curvature of the Earth. So in fact, it might come in here and say, well, this person owns this much, this length of line right here for land. Well, guess what? They may own more than that because there might be a ravine in there and they haven't measured the slope of the ravine. There might be a hill in there. So they might own significantly more surface area. Now, when we talk about a cadastral map, this map is intended to show access and property ownership of the public. access and property ownership. Therefore, we need to bring the scale in quite a bit. A real common scale for this is one inch is equal to 50 feet, one inch is equal to 100 feet. As opposed to a topographical map, which has a common scale of one inch to 2,000 feet. So we've got a whole order of magnitude to a geographic map, the first one we looked at, which a common scale for that is one inch is equal to 200,000 feet. When we're showing whole states or stuff. Yes, there you go. Say I have a scale of the miles. What's that? It's like, I have seen a couple of maps where they say like one inch is like so and so miles. Or yeah, one inch is one mile or 5,280 feet. I think that's a 15 minute quad. Okay. Typically we use a seven and a half minute quad because we can measure directly with our scales off of them. Okay. But I, we got those in lesson three in here. I can't remember the name of it exactly, but yes, they do have those. Okay. Okay. All right, so cadastro map used to show property ownership. There will be an elevation tie on these but it will not be shown on the map other than just reference it saying, you know, here's a corner and the elevation is this. 
and it won't be carried through the map. It will just be a tie. For your meets and bounds. Yeah, well, it's not really for your meets and bounds, but just to kind of give you an idea of how high above sea level that you are. Okay, so in essence, there's been slight differences as we've come through so far. Okay, so let me just recap. We've got a geographic map, scales very large, used to locate items in relationship to each other. We come a little smaller, come to topographical map, and we add the Z dimension to it. These are all geographic maps in nature. Then we come to a cadastral map, which is synonymous, really, in my mind, with a subdivision plat, okay, where a plat is a map of multiple pieces of property. That's the same thing as a cadastral. Those two words are interchangeable. Most people say plat because it's hard to say cadastral. <laughs> so we make it easier to say, right? There is a book of drawings just on the other side of Gabe's desk, on the desk that's not being used there, that has, it hasn't been updated in a number of years, but it had all of the subdivision plats and Twin Falls in it up to about 1985. Now you can go through there, many of you can probably find your house in there. I can find the house my parents bought when we first moved here back in the late 60s. But that's just a book of plats or cadastral maps. By the way, Twin Falls City, the assessor's office manages these. You can get a picture of any piece of property. It is public information. It'll probably cost you a dime for the copy. All you gotta do is go ask. Um, Here's another one that we've included in here. This one's pretty hard to read, but here again, you've got a geographic map. Now this is a subdivision, it's a cadastral map or a plat map. Notice that on this one, I, I like to keep it in here just because it also can include natural features to aid in referencing. Now this one's kind of surrounded by water and you see all that as a reference. So if we do have a natural feature that will help us locate, don't be afraid to include it. We have several in our areas that are very distinctive, that everybody knows where they're at. Yeah, we've got Snake River Canyon, which is an obvious one. We've got Rock Creek Canyon. There's some others, Cedar Draw. Most people know where that is. Uh, Mellon Valley, where we talk about large areas, the Hagerman Valley, and these types of areas. Okay, we're going to start getting into kind of some specialty maps now. Folks, there's a map for anything you want. <laughs> so with a little bit of search, you can get a lot of information. So here's an aeronautical chart. In essence, this is a geographic map with some information added to it. It's got kind of a bullseye looking on it. Where do you think that bullseye, the center of the bullseye, what do you think is at the center of that? Um, if I'm in an airplane, it's an airport. <laughs> I want to know where the airport is, right? And I lose an engine, where do I got to get to? So in essence, what they've done on this one is they've actually made a geographic map of the sky and related it to what you can see on the ground. So you're going to see little areas like this that come out. This might be a no-fly zone or something they know they can't approach from here. You might have hazards that are out on the, something that you would see up in the air. Like for us, the Snake River Canyon is really a no-fly zone. I don't think you can put a fixed wing down in it because we got a lot of cables running across it. Um, you can take a helicopter into it and they fly those little light wings down into it all the time because they do it by my house. But I don't think you can take a fixed wing aircraft into our canyon. So there are areas like that. Now these rings are generally set at some set mileage. So you have a thick one that might be 50 miles or 10 miles, 
a thinner one that's going to put you five miles away so that you can track your way into an airfield. Wait, what's a fixed wing, not fixed wing? You mean they fly not fixed wing? What, what a fixed wing's like a Cessna or a jet or something that's got a fixed wing on it. So why would you fly that didn't have a wing? Why would you fly something that didn't have a wing? Well, you don't consider an ultralight that is using uh, uh, something to have okay. a fixed wing. A helicopter does not have a fixed wing. Okay. So you could hang glider in there. Hang glider would not be a fixed wing. Okay. They, so they don't, they don't have, have a fixed wing. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right. So aeronautical chart, geographic map that also includes an air pathway. Okay, I talked about this one yesterday. This is a map you're probably only going to see in the civil world. If you open the civil flat files in the back, um, in our gray flat files, you're going to see literally hundreds of these in there. It, it's a great drawing style, and it works great with any structure that is dealing with the earth. So in essence, what you'll see with a plan profile, there's quite a few things on this, and I'm not going to get into all of them right now, that are very specific to this drawing. And one is that you will have a plan view of the project in the top. You will have a full section of the view in the bottom. The top part is, in essence, a geographic map. It will have elevation control. So you will have the Z dimension on here. Now it's probably, it might be shown in topo lines, but it might not also. It might be done with survey markers, saying this point is this high, this point is this high. So it will have elevation. Now we then tie that to the bottom part, which we call the profile. The profile is a full section along the center line of the project. You cannot project from one to the other. You can't project from this view to this view. Okay, so it's not really orthographic projection. We do. Yeah, we make these. All right, let me show you how you kind of break these and follow what they're doing. We break them because we have station marks. So a station, let me define that. I'll do it over here. A station, this is a linear measurement. from the start of a project. Along its center line. Usually, it is stated in this fashion, where I would have Something like, in this case, 50 plus 0, 0. This is a station measurement. Okay. Now what we're looking at here is that these, right here, are your 10s and 1s in feet, typically. These are your 100s. So when I would tell somebody, hey, I want you to install a culvert on this road, and you're going to install it at station 50 plus 00. zero. Okay, we know where the project starts or where the road 00, zero is. I measure along the center line of that road for 5,000 feet, and when I hit that 5,000 foot mark, that's where the culvert goes. Okay. So it's just a way for us to lay these things out. 
Notice on this one here is listed as station 50. That's that little check mark right there. That's station 50 plus 00. zero. Notice down here on the profile, I have a little 50 right here. That's the same point. Okay. That little point right there on the grid is that little hash mark right there on that center line. Okay, so this is how we correlate the two to each other because this thing's on an angle. This is a full section down that line. You can kind of see this is an inclined plane, right? And so this is, when we come to here, I, I want to see both of them true size so we can't project. We've got to use station marks. Okay, that's why we do this. This is full size, but it's an inclined plane. I'm taking a section where I've taken this, I've rotated it 90 degrees and drawn the section here. So when I come to station 51, here's station 55 right here, that corresponds right down here to station 55. Elevation is shown here. So the profile will have, have elevation. Yes, Maja? So the number 50 from where it came? Um, it came from the start of the project, where the start of the project is station 0 plus 0, 0, or 0 feet. So why did we assume it's 50? Um, because I, the project's too big to show all of it on one drawing. There's, you know, I might show from station 0 to station 10 on one sheet, go to the next sheet, it's station 10 to 20, go to the next sheet, station 20 to 30, and, and we have many roads that we build that are over 5,000 feet long. Okay, so it, and it always starts at zero plus zero, zero, and it goes to the end of the project. Okay. One last comment on this, and then we're going to kind of walk away from it. 